Um, we uh, we want to get started uh, and uh, get Marcus up here and talk about his uh, his story and his company. So if we wouldn't mind getting seated, we'll get started here. Um, so I want to uh, spend a few minutes telling you about my company, and then I'm going to introduce Marcus and some of the some of the things that he's doing. Um, my company started uh, around a story, and this is a true story. And I have a friend who ran a, a fairly large retail company. Well, I'll, I'll stand behind here. Uh, I have a friend who uh, ran a, a large retail company, has stores around the US. And uh, he related a story to me. And uh, uh, he had t talked about a mother who had called into their corporate headquarters and had talked to them, called in very distraught. She was crying. She uh, uh, was very upset. And her son, who had recently been promoted in the military as a platoon leader, had been caught at one of their stores for stealing a fishing lure. And um, she knew that if he were prosecuted for this crime, this would be something that would follow him around for the rest of his life. And very apropos to what, what we were just discussing. And, uh, and she knew that this, this young man is very promising, had leadership qualities, very promising career, and made a mistake. She wasn't saying, hey, you know, uh, let him off, or you know, he didn't do this. She knew that he had made this mistake, but she also didn't want this, this young man to be uh, uh, paying for this for the rest of his life. So then I asked him, I said, so what, what did you do? Uh, he said, well, we, we prosecuted him. And I was surprised. I said, well, why, why would you do that? And uh, he said, well, we don't have any other option. Our policy is that if you are caught stealing from us that we call the police, the police will show up, and then it goes through the criminal justice system. We don't have the, the leeway, unless we do this across the board, to have accountability and provide someone a second chance. And so that's what um, started a, a CEC, is to provide people a second chance, but still have them accountable for you know, the, the, the actions that they took. You know, with the, the other challenge was that how are you going to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system and give someone a second chance? How are you going to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system and have the uh, accountability for the actions that they were taking? And how do you have accountability and reduce the likelihood that they're going to come back and repeat that crime again? So that's how CEC, that's why we started a Corrective Education Company. Um, we uh, started this under the principles of restorative justice. Restorative justice is where the offender and the victim, in this case the retailer, can come together and say, you know, there's actually a more productive way of handling this, this issue. And we understood that it was using technology in order to make that happen. The technology enables us to scale it across multiple locations. The technology allows us to uh, verify who the individuals are. But then the, the most important thing of this was the education. So once a person goes through the process, so traditionally they would be apprehended by the store. The store would then recover the item, call the police, the police would come and show up and then they go through the whole criminal justice system. The store would then get involved with uh, going to the criminal justice system. And um, uh, so that whole process was eliminated and going through our program where uh, offer them a, uh, uh, an education program where they had voluntarily sign up and go through this, this education program. That program um, has a, allowed us to do three main things, the impact of this. First is we have shown that less than 2% recidivism rate. After five years, 
we look across like-for-like -like stores and less than 2% recidivism rate. Second is that we have um, about an 85% reduction in the store's time spent on an individual case. And finally, there's been a 40% um, reduction in calls for service for law enforcement. Uh, so law enforcement and the offenders, those are our two biggest fans. Those are the, the folks that uh, appreciate us, us the most. Um, the, we call them students, the, the individuals that sign up for our program. They sign up to eliminate uh, going through the whole criminal justice process. But at the end of the day, the reason uh, why they stay away is because that they were given this second chance. They were learn how to uh, change their behavior, work on life skills, and ultimately have the opportunity to go and, and uh, participate in communities. It's been very successful in, uh, in where we are and what we're doing. And um, if you want to know more, um, I'm happy to talk about it more. Um, uh, I, I, I got a chance to talk to Marcus, and um, I'm in awe of you know, anyone who starts a company. I started this company. It is very, very hard. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the young lady, that Teresa, that um, she's an entrepreneur. She started a company. Um, the gentleman in the back, Tulio, uh, started a company. It's very difficult to start a company. You, uh, you have to have a drive. You have to stay up late at night. You have to think about multiple things. And Marcus did that. But then to start a company with a mission, to start a company that actually uh, has a profound impact on individual lives is what's really meaningful. So um, it's my honor to introduce Marcus Bullock. He's the founder and CEO. Um, he started a company called Flick Shop. Um, I'm going to let him talk about his life story and uh, where he came from. Uh, Flick Shop, uh, it's a unique technology that helps humans, individuals that have been incarcerated to connect with their loved ones, individuals outside, and ultimately help them in re-entry back into, uh, into our communities. So without uh, further ado, I'll introduce Marcus. Marcus. Thank you guys, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me, can everyone hear me? I really don't need a microphone, but because we're recording, I'll go ahead and use it. I love using microphones in audiences like this because it makes me feel like I'm a rapper. I had like those ambitions of like spinning bars back in the day. So if you see me swaggering a little bit, it's only because I want to get my fake Jay-Z on. <laughs> so in 2005, um, I started Perspectives Premier Contractors. I started Perspectives Premier Contractors while I was working at a paint store. I was working at a paint store and I was mixing paint. You guys have seen it before. If you own a home or if you have a friend that wanted to ha paint a house on a Saturday, then you have been to a paint store and asked them to mix up a color of blue for you. I was that guy who mixed up a color of blue. When people would come into my paint store, they would ask me, they would say, Marcus, well, how much do you charge to paint my kitchen? And I would tell them, you know, well, we don't paint kitchens here. We sell you the paint so that you can paint your own kitchen. And so it was interesting to have those conversations over and over again with customers in the paint store because right behind it, I would see the painters that would also come into the paint store. And this is 2005. This is the height of the real estate boom. And these painters would say, oh, man, there's no work out here. It's hard. It's really, really challenging to find work. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I can't believe that you're telling me this because Ms. Johnson just walked in the door and asked me how much do I charge to paint a kitchen. And so I saw an amazing opportunity for me. And I started Perspectives Premier Contractors. I became the conduit between the Ms. Johnsons of the world and the painters of the world. When Ms. Johnson would come in, I would say, hey, you know what? We will paint your kitchen for you, Blue. And then I would contact those painters, and I would say, I got a job for you. I became that conduit, and over time, we grew a small painting business when I was 25 years old into a company that generated over $4 million a year just a few years later. 
It was an amazing, amazing opportunity for me. And I'm going to tell you, I had never seen anything like this, and this any, any kind of money like this. The experiences, the opportunities, traveling the, around the world simply because I was able to paint a few kitchens. It was incredible for me. And then later, as I grew and grew and grew this painting business, there were friends of mine who were in prison, and they loved to be able to hear about the amazing things that happened while I was going on I was, while I was building this business. And I would tell them while they were in prison, I would say, man, look, I'm going to write you, and I'm going to send you pictures. I'm going to take pictures of the job site. I'm going to go to the Bahamas. I'm taking pictures of that. I met this new girl last week. I'm going to send you pictures of her. And none of these things ever happened because in prison, there's no access to technology. There's no access to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or texting or even, you don't have those kinds of the same things that we see and use every day. 2.2 million people don't have access to it. They aren't connected to their families. And I was like, man, look, I tell you what, it would be so, so cool if I could just text you. I mean, if I could text you what was going on in the Bahamas, my life would be so much easier. And I went into the, what do we do every time we find a problem? When we find a problem, right, we go straight to the app store and go look for a solution. But there was no app to be able to help solve my problem. So what did my crazy retarded behind do? I said, I'm going to build one. <laughs> it was the hardest thing I had ever done, but it was one of the most meaningful things I had ever done. Several years later, we found out that the mobile app that now you can download in your app store, and this will be the one time when if you're looking down at your phone, you're either tweeting about FlickShop or downloading FlickShop, I promise you I won't be mad at you. <laughs> if you download it, make sure you review it in your app store. This was the, it was crazy because I saw that the same friends that I wanted to take pictures of and I wanted to text and I wanted to send pictures of, I mean, these amazing trips and yet the girls too, I was able to connect with them in a way that they hadn't seen before and I didn't realize that now over 300,000 photos shared and over a quarter of a million families that we've connected with our technology, that this was a major problem around the country. See, there was a level of ingenuity that actually came behind this that I'm really, really proud of but that is where the story is right now today while I'm standing on the stage in South by Southwest. See, if owning a tech firm will get you on a stage in South by Southwest. But what I will tell you is that the story didn't start there. It started in 1996 when I was 15 years old. I put a gun out on somebody at a mall. I carjacked them and took their car. I carjacked them, I took their car at 16 years old and I stood before a judge just a, a few weeks later to listen to him sentenced me to 23 years to life in an adult prison. Super maximum security prisons all around the country. And the favor that he did for me is that he reduced my sentence. He, he suspended 15 years of my sentence and left me with eight years to serve as a child in adult prisons. See, I understood while I was in prison that mail me everything. The connection to the family meant everything. It was only because of the connections that we were able to create with my family members that allowed me to be able to stay on the path that kept me sane, just sane enough to think that I had audacity to use that same ingenuity to be able to create a business. It was only because of those connections to my mom and those ridiculously expensive collect calls that I spent with over and over again for eight years. Now, I'm not, I mean, let me paint a picture for you. We're talking about my 16th birthday, my 17th birthday, my 18th birthday, my 19th birthday, my 20th birthday, my 21st birthday, my 22nd birthday. You know, as a matter of fact, let me pause for a second. On my 21st birthday, someone came into my cell and said, hey, Marcus, I just made some wine underneath my bed just a few hours ago. Do you want to drink it to celebrate the 21st birthday? That's how I bought it in. Yes, I did drink it. And if any of you correction officers are watching that later, I'm so sorry. But I'm home now. Can't do nothing about it. Let it go. But I spent so many years in prison, and I worked on a plan. I've spent so many years in prison, and I worked on trying to build an opportunity to be able to do something incredible when I came home. What would happen in our country if we used prison facilities as college campuses? What would happen in our country if we used prison facilities as a place where we would actually train people, the hungriest people in the country? I mean, did you guys watch what they were able to do out there in California with just teaching how to code on paper? I don't know how, let me tell you something, I own the mobile app. It is hard as heck to build technologies. 
thank you guys so much for what you guys doing at the last mile because I promise you it's only because of these opportunities and programs and that ingenuity that allows a collection of people. I mean, because how many graduates does Harvard have? I can tell you how many graduates that Greensville Correctional Facility had. See, we prepare these people, and when we start talking about reentry, we, we start talking about college graduation and careers and professional atmospheres well before people graduate from college, but we don't start talking about reentry until you come home from prison. Now you're home from prison, and now it's time to collect data, and now it's time to talk about how badly we need a job, and now we want to be able to place you in some type of housing, but yet for the entire eight years I was in prison, you know what I did? I played spades. <laughs> See, you know, the thing of it is is that we have to prepare for reentry at arrest and not post-release. Imagine a world where we turn these prisons into an atmosphere of learning and not for just strictly punishment. And then I am actually want you to imagine what you would do if you were part of the solution. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm hanging. There we go. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. That is, that is our program. I would uh, especially like to thank the Texas Public Policy Foundation for their excellent work and hosting and all of their support. It's been just wonderful. Um, our partners, of course, the Coalition for Public Safety, the Charles Koch Institute, thank you. Um, I, I also would like to recognize uh, Nathan Lemer. If you'd please stand up, Nathan. <laughs> Thank you for all of your hard work in doing this. Nathan was, up until recently, a member of the R Street Institute. He's left us for the FCC. Congratulations. You are already missed at R Street, just not a lot. So, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Please have some drinks, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>